Great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Today's webcast is Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in Digital Learning. My name is Megan Raymond. I am the Senior Director of Programs and Membership here at WCET. And I'm so thankful that you're joining us for this conversation today and our amazing lineup of conversationalists. As we go through, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the, into the question box, preferably not the chat box, because we do tend to lose track of them in there. We'll have a pause toward the end for Q&A, but if there's a question we feel like we need to jump in and address, we certainly will. You can access the slides via the link in the chat box and follow along on Twitter if you'd like. The hashtag is WCET webcast. This webinar is hosted in partnership with Every Learner Everywhere and live captioning is provided by our sponsor, Vitac. Again, enter any questions into the question box and we'll make sure to get to those. And I'd like to go ahead and kick it off by introducing our moderator today, Dr. Jessica Roland Williams, who directs the Every Learner Everywhere Initiative, which is a grant and she'll tell you more about it, but there are several partners that are um, getting together to help move the needle on some very, very promising practices. And I'll let Jessica tell you more about that. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, as Megan said, I'm Jessica Roland Williams and I'm the director of Every Learner Everywhere. And it's so great to be here with you representing Every Learner Everywhere and to share with you in this webcast that supports our mission of helping institutions use new technology and innovative teaching and learning strategies um, with the ultimate goal of improving outcomes specifically for Black, Latinx, Indigenous students, poverty affected students, and first generation students. And our network is a network of 12 partner organizations that all have expertise in evaluating, implementing, scaling, and measuring the efficacy of educational technology. Um, and our network also has expertise in curricular design and course design strategies, teaching practices, um, and support services that personalize instruction for students in blended and online learning environments, as well as those who are leveraging courseware um, in face-to-face -face learning environments. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we are living in a time of compounding crises. Um, everyone knows we're living through a global pandemic. Um, we're also living through an economic downturn. Um, we're also you know, facing a lot of fallout from this shift from um, you know, face-to-face -face classes to having to teach in this emergency remote online learning environment. Um, and, and there are a number of other things that are impacting our students, our faculty, our administrators, our institutions as a whole. Um, what we're hearing from our students is that they're overwhelmed, they're distracted. Um, many of them are facing job loss. You know, what we're hearing from, you know, <laughs> everyone is that we're all tired of being on Zoom. Um, we're all experiencing Zoom fatigue. Um, but we're also hearing from our faculty that, um, you know, there's a great need for support right now because they're really being thrown into just such a challenging situation and asked to do a lot at the same time. And so the Every Learner Everywhere um, network is very sensitive to that and, and really wanting to find new ways to support faculty during this um, both very difficult time, but also um, very pivotal moment um, in, you know, kind of the, the trajectory of higher education. Um, and we have um, launched a new initiative that we're calling the ELE Expert Network. And um, this network provides one-on-one -on -one coaching and equitable practices in teaching and learning for digital learning um, for anyone in higher education. And so I'd like to emphasize that this is an incredible service. Um, it's a completely free service um, where faculty, administrators, instructional designers, um, anyone um, can access our pool of equity experts. These are all um, professionals who have deep expertise in creating equitable online learning spaces or digital learning spaces. Um, and they can coach you one-on-one -on -one with whatever your specific needs are. Um, these experts have time this week this Friday to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. So I encourage you to go to our website that's linked in the chat and schedule time with them. And you're lucky enough to actually have the opportunity to hear from two of our experts you know, during this webcast today. And so um, without further ado, I'd like to give Blaine and Taz an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, but before I do that, I just would like to, again, thank you for your time, you know, spending time with us today. 
Um, I know this session is going to be really informative um, and also just encourage you to spread the word about this free one-on-one -on -one coaching service um, that's really you know one of a kind that we're launching um, and visit our website today to schedule time with these experts. Um, so Blaine, uh, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Blaine Smith and I'm an associate professor of new literacies and bi multilingual immigrant learners at the University of Arizona. And I'm also the co-director of the Digital Innovation and Learning Lab. And my teaching and research um, centers on the digital literacies of culturally and linguistically diverse youth, in particular, how to scaffold inclusive learning um, and helping instructors with uh, instructional strategies to implement in the classroom. Great. Taz, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Tazine Daniels. Um, some people call me Taz. I am uh, one of the experts in the network that Jessica had mentioned before. Uh, my background is in medical anthropology and part of what got me into the field of educational development was my research, which was around Adderall use among college students. And so presently I am an educational developer, consultant and coach, and I've been working in higher education for about 15 years and specifically the last 10 years, spent a lot of time preparing uh, faculty as well as administrators for uh, creating uh, online courses and online degree programs. Um, Currently, I'm at the University of Michigan at the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, where I'm an assistant director. Happy to be here. Great. So I want to start again by just kind of, you know, framing this moment. Um, I think this moment is, you know, important, one, because we're all kind of living through this crisis together. Um, but, you know, we also talk about how this is just <laughs> a unique opportunity and a unique moment in higher education. Um, for us to really, you know, reflect on a lot of different things. And so for starters, I'd like to ask how, you know, some of the things that we're faced with, such as the global pandemic, the economic crisis, the current political environment, the heightened visibility of racial violence, and other things um, have influenced your professional environments. Um, Taz, do you want to start? Yeah, um, thank you, Jessica, for offering that framing at the very beginning um, to kind of remind us where we are in this moment. Um, and I would say that right now we're not just seeing an unmasking of longstanding issues, but an exacerbation of longstanding issues. Um, and I'm sure that we'll get to this kind of throughout our talk today, but uh, there is kind of a fantasy that higher education is immune from sister systems of power and oppression, when in fact higher education is a product of those systems. Um, and that is a hard reality for some of us to face because it's easier to think that the walls of the classroom protect our students from all of the terrible things that happen outside. But most of us who've been in education for a while know that, in fact, everything that happens to students outside, the political climate, uh, life at home, um, mm -hmm. all of those experiences and factors definitely shape and influence their ability to learn in a classroom space. Uh, and so what I would say is that that is not any different the virtual walls don't protect students any more than the um, than the physical walls of the classroom, and so I think it's important for uh, instructors and administrators to recognize that not only have those issues always been there, but currently with the pandemic, with increased awareness around uh, racial violence in the country, these things are exacerbated. I would also add that, um, in particular, some of the inequities that are incredibly <laughs> exacerbated that I think we need to all remember. Uh, a revolver on access, uh, access to resources for students. So lots of research coming out talking about the financial stress that students are under right now. Mm -hmm. I think current research is showing that, you know, between 60 and 70% of students are reporting uh, financial stress, uh, experiences of being displaced from their dorms, not having a, uh, a stable place to live, food insecurities, um, our student mental health services are overstretched. Again, they've always been overstretched, but in particular right now, instances of depression um, and just anxiety are, you know, they're affecting us. They're definitely affecting our students. Um, many students have increased care responsibilities at home, uh, especially uh, quote unquote non-traditional students or um, folks that, again, we don't see those aspects of their lives, <laughs> right? When they are maybe in the classroom, but in virtual remote settings, that's definitely going to be a factor. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention the fact that the COVID-19 virus does disproportionately impact, you know, minoritized students that Jessica mentioned that list. Um, 
because of inequities in healthcare. And so these are students who are at higher risk because of socio social determinants of health, but also uh, have family members and community members that they are worried about and, and trying to, uh, you know, to, to look after and to care for. And I think the bottom line is that all of that impacts a student's ability to learn in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. Blaine, how are you seeing things impact your professional environment? Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of the same things that Taz just described. So um, even in my undergraduate and graduate courses, um, I'm hearing how students are struggling and deeply affected by what's going on right now. Several students have contacted me telling me they're not doing well, they're struggling with depression or anxiety, they're having difficulty concentrating and learning in the new online environment. And then some students have, you know, revealed to me that they have a family member who's sick and that it's really difficult to be in courses while that's going on. Um, from a faculty perspective, uh, we're feeling very stretched thin um, with having to teach online with not receiving adequate support. Um, many faculty, particularly female colleagues, as I'm sure as many participants um, would agree, are struggling with having children at home while also working full time. And then there's also the challenge of faculty understanding the need to implement equity focused education and how to best do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important. And that was kind of the heart of the, you know, the ELE equity expert, um, I'm sorry, the ELE expert network um, was just to get at that question, the how, right? I think a lot of people are hearing things and they're really encouraged and they want to do the right things, but it's hard to know where to start. And so, um, you know, we'll get into a little bit of that here. And of course, there's still opportunities for us to, for that one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So Taz, I want to come back to something that you said, because I think it's um, really important to note that the shift to remote learning has not, not only created new challenges for colleges and universities to deliver, you know, high quality equity focused education, but it, you, you know, you mentioned how it's also unmasked challenges, right? So these are not new, they were always there. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I think certainly uh, an obvious piece is the boundaries between classroom and not classroom right home life are dramatically shifted. Um, I can't help but think about our first year college students who are so excited to go get that face-to-face -face live experience. I'm, I'm at the University of Michigan. You know, that is a big deal when a student um, gets into the University of Michigan. And then, uh, you know, to forego the dorm experience or to have that cut short and come back, uh, that is, that's a very difficult thing for people to deal with. And so I think that, you know, there is already, um, how do I put this? There's already uh, a sense of loss that students are feeling, um, but we have to recognize that not every first year student is the same. Mm -hmm. And although there is that kind of school spirit of like, yes, you've arrived um, at, at this institution, you've achieved so much, there's almost what I would see as like a, an invisible leveling that happens, <laughs> right? That all first year students are the same. You look out into a chemistry 100 class and see 400 people and they're all the same. And in fact, everybody had a very, very different journey to get there. For some people, University of Michigan was like written in the cards, right? It's a legacy. For other people, like it took a lot. It took a lot and it took a lot of financial investments, a lot of sacrifice on their part. Um, they're working part-time jobs, now those part-time jobs are gone, right? Because mm -hmm. coffee shops are closed, grocery stores are closed. And so I think that that invisible kind of leveling, we're now starting to see like having these disproportional impacts. Um, and so that's, that's maybe an example of how I see things starting to get unmasked. I also would mention is that we're now seeing a lot more national attention and hearing a lot more student voices. So it's a little bit harder to ignore. Yeah. I think that you, that's so huge that you bring that up because that's such a huge misconception that comes up that you know you don't you don't see beyond the classroom you just kind of everyone you know comes into the classroom and they seem to have the be in the same space and kind of have the same access and you don't you don't really have the opportunity usually to see beyond that and now we're beginning to see you know to your point that not all students are the same um, and they and they come from very different backgrounds. Um, what are some other uh, Blaine? you know, misconceptions that you've seen about, specifically about inequities mm -hmm. um, happening in the digital classroom? Yeah, that's a great question. So a main misconception about inequities in the digital classroom is that students today are digital natives and fluent with using a variety of technology for different purposes. 
Um, relatedly, there's a misconception that students have access to digital tools and the internet. So just to give you an example, um, the summer I worked with indigenous students in a teacher education program who are expected to join class remotely from their native nation lands. And many students in these rural areas did not have adequate broadband or reliable technology. Um, fortunately, the university stepped in to triage the situation and establish some hotspots in these areas. But I'm sure others um, joining have had students uh, joining Zoom classes from parking lots where they get better service or expressing a wide range of difficulty with using the technology. Um, so it's really important that we realize that many students, particularly in rural, rural and underserved communities, do not have access or proper access. Um, and then also thinking beyond digital tools, students also need help with the digital literacies underlying meaning making in online environments. So this includes effectively analyzing online information and being able to communicate through multimedia. Yeah, that's so huge, Blaine. I mean, I think we we do come in thinking, oh, you know, well, not millennials. What is the student, new, the new mm -hmm. college age students? What are they known as? Gen Z. Gen, is it Gen Z? You know, we think, oh, well, they're on social media all day, so you know, they must know how to, you know, leverage courseware to learn online, and that's not the case at all. Um, and in fact, a lot of times, you know, there, there's also this layer. Oh, it's Gen Z. Okay, thanks, someone in the put in the chat. Zoomers. <laughs> um, you know, there's also a whole layer of developing study skills for learning online. Um, you know, just like you had, you know, we all have to learn how to learn in a classroom. Um, and there are tools and techniques that help us become better learners. The same is true for online. And a lot of people aren't naturally, you know, born with that ability in the same way that you're not always naturally born with the ability to learn from a classroom setting or from a lecture setting. Um, and I think that's just so critical to highlight. Um, so one of the things that's been most encouraging to me is that, you know, faculty and administrators have really demonstrated this new awareness for the need for equitable learning spaces for students. And I think that's a real positive, a real bright spot. Um, and so in a lot of ways, we can see the field shifting. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of that shift is just being born out of this new awareness. Um, what you know, things have you guys seen or shifts have you seen in the field recently that you feel really make it poised for change towards diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in ways that maybe it wasn't before? Um, I can start. So I think for me, it's hard to disentangle the shift to remote teaching from the pandemic and also for the increased visibility of racial violence um, across the country and frankly, across the world. Um, it feels like people are forced to pay attention in a way, <laughs> perhaps because most of us are at home kind of doom scrolling on Twitter and watching the media to see that like, hey, um, this is not just something at my institution, this is actually a national systemic issue. And by bringing national kind of like concerted attention to these things, I think um, it actually in many ways makes it easier to convince people to get started. And by people, I mean, administrators, faculty, staff, leaders, people who are in power, who have, who have ability to influence the system, because you don't get the same sense of defensiveness, right, that this is just a University of Michigan problem or just an Arizona State problem, that this is actually systemic and historic, uh, historically situated. Um, and so I think you're right, Jessica, that does create this kind of opportunity. All eyes are on the intersection of these things. And so I'm so happy to see uh, interdisciplinary synergies, right? Uh, thinking about police brutality as a public health issue. I never heard of things like that before, <laughs> at least not in national discourse. And now we're hearing about that and how remote teaching can lead to equity. And um, so, so I think that for me, there is this moment to hold on to because people are ready to try. I've had I've met so many people in the last year, people who I, you know, who I've heard of because they are higher up administrators of my institution who are now reaching out to me and my colleagues because they no longer are, and I don't wanna say using the excuse because it, it makes sense to me that they will think, oh, we have so many things to do. How can we prioritize online education or equity and, and, and online education? But now they're ready to try and find the experts that are out there, which I think is fantastic. But one caveat that I will add is that think about who is being tapped to do this work, right? So 
on the one hand, I'm so excited that people are reaching out <laughs> and are interested and want to get it done, but recognize that it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of patience. Um, and it's mostly uh, minoritized faculty and staff members who are doing this work, oftentimes uncompensated. And so that's another reason why, you know, working with the expert network has been a great opportunity for me because it not only gets the word across exponentially, but also properly compensates people for the good work that they're doing. Yeah, I've seen... Um, some promising shifts in the field recently focused on ways to scaffold student learning that focuses on diversity, equity, inclusiveness. And this includes examining the way important point and you know. Oh. Should I go ahead? Okay. Yes, go <laughs> Sorry ahead. About Sorry. That. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this examines the ways technology might reify hegemonic structures in the classroom or be used in innovative ways to disrupt traditional classroom hierarchies and promote social justice, collaboration, innovative learning, and amplifying student voices. So that's been promising to me to see. Yeah, both important points, you know, just to double click on Blaine's point about, you know, amplifying student voice, I, I've also seen that a, an increase in that recently and it's kind of long overdue quite frankly for us to start listening to you know the population that we've often tried to solve for um, and then also i just want to circle back to what you said taz about um this piece about compensation and compensating people for their expertise and you know we didn't say this but the um the ELE expert is act the ELE Expert Network is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so while this is a free service to the field, um, all of our experts are compensated for their time. And so again, it's just a great opportunity for you to you know, get the information that you need without taxing um, you know, maybe a colleague of color, um, you know, um, even though your intentions are good, um, you know, being sensitive to, to their time um, and truly compensating them for their expertise. So I think it's important to, you know, highlight the fact that while we work towards building a more equitable environment, inclusive space on our campuses, um, you know, this does not come with just a commitment or an interest alone, you know, and it's great that we're seeing this increased awareness and, and it's great, you know, that people are ready to try, Taz, that's what I heard you say, you know, people are ready to try, but wanting to try is not enough, right? Um, it's important that we have strategies that are effective and also that we have consistent action. Um, and so we wanted to highlight some of those strategies um, in this web, webcast. So um, I'll start with Taz. Um, what are two or three strategies that you can leave or share um, that administrators can leverage to move forward towards building more equity and digital learning on their campus? Yeah, so the good news is you're not starting from scratch. So there, I guarantee you, are people on your campus that are rocking it, <laughs> who have done the work, who've gotten the professional development, who maybe have been teaching online, who have been thinking about accessibility and equity for a long time, who actually made the shift into the remote teaching quite easily um, if they needed to shift at all. Uh, sans, of course, all the caveats with the pandemic. Um, and so I think the first thing I would recommend is identify who those champions are across the across the university and all the different disciplines and get them to talk to each other. Um, I think building a community of practice around inclusive, equitable online teaching is going to be key because not only is it going to help you recognize what are the strengths across your university, where are the resources, but also where are the gaps, where are the weaknesses. Um, and so I think finding those champions and let me just specify by champions, I don't just mean faculty. I mean, graduate student instructors, I will tell you the best ideas around this come from graduate student instructors um, and also undergrads who have been now in a number of courses and can give you feedback. Um, and I think the same thing for you should be compensating, you know, uh, consultants, you should also be incentivizing and compensating faculty for this showcasing and rewarding good teaching. So things like um, 
certificate programs or grants for innovative teaching and equitable teaching, um, teaching awards, those are all great incentives that hopefully uh, can incentivize faculty and should count towards uh, tenure and promotion. So I think for administrators, it's really about setting a priority. So even if you're coming from a research institution, maybe in, even finding opportunities to attach research to teaching and have that count towards tenure and promotion. So I think those are some really good ideas to start. Those are great. And um, Blaine, could you tell us two or three strategies that faculty could use to implement, um, to, I'm sorry, to create a more equitable digital learning space in the classroom? Sure. So the first is to implement culturally responsive instruction. And this involves positioning students' cultural and linguistic identities at the core of the learning process and also leveraging um, their experiences in the classroom. So one way that faculty can do this is by offering meaningful opportunities to connect for students to connect content to their lives and communities, as well as creating online um, community within the classroom for students uh, to feel comfortable sharing their experiences. A second strategy, and I think this addresses um, a question Richard brought up, is um, thinking about how to implement a universal design for learning framework, which involves thinking about multiple ways to engage all students. Um, so faculty should not only offer content in more than one format, but also allow students to express their understanding in multiple ways. So one example would be through digital multimodal projects that ask students to express their understanding through visual, sound, movement, and text, often in digital formats, so like videos or podcasts. And really a growing body of research is showing that when teachers integrate this type of um, assessments that they offer multiple points of entry for students to agentively express themselves. Um, these projects offer flexibility for students to connect to personally meaningful topics, as well as, a, as well as an empowering platform to share their views with others. Yeah, that's so that's so helpful. Um, and, and thank you guys for sharing those strategies. I think it's also important to note that there really is no one size fits all to this, though, you know, and context is important. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just so important to understand, you know, who you're serving, what you're trying to accomplish, you know, what the challenge points are. Um, and so, um, but thank you for giving us some some good places to start. Um, we also know that making progress is not always about what we start doing, but it's also about what we stop doing. Um, so I thought it would also be helpful for you all to both give me an example of one thing that we should stop doing. So Taz, what's one thing that administrators should stop doing right now? Okay, I have two things. Okay. <laughs> I'll make them quick. So I think the first one is confusing emergency remote teaching with intentional quality online teaching. Absolutely. Um, I keep reminding myself uh, that we are in the middle of a pandemic. And so there's um, a kind of rhetoric that I keep hearing of like, oh, you know, we got to get used to the new normal. Um, there is nothing normal about what's happening right now. So I think we have to be really clear about managing expectations and also being clear about what those new expectations are and continue to get feedback. Um, the second, I will say, I was talking to one of the other experts in our network, Dr. Chandani Patel about this question, cause she also, she's at New York University and works with a lot of administrators. And I really like this. It's that administrators, you don't have to pretend like you know everything. <laughs> this, is, this is a really um, important thing that I, I hope people take away from this is that um, oftentimes when people in power, especially if you hold privileged identities, white, cisgendered, male, um, it is easy to get defensive or feel ashamed that you don't have an answer or solution to this problem in front of you. And so I think um, it's important to hear that there is so much power in showing vulnerability to admitting mistakes, right? You did the best you could with the information you had, but you're actively gathering more information. You're taking the time to educate yourself and you're demonstrating what growth as a leader looks like. And so you don't have to pretend like you know everything. We know you don't, I don't know everything, which is why it's important for us to work together. So, so wise. Um, Blaine, same question. 
Yeah, so connected to my earlier point, faculty should stop assuming students are digital natives and possess the needed um, digital literacies or access to technology. And it's really helpful for faculty to conduct a survey at the beginning of the course to gain an understanding and like the landscape of students access and comfort with using different tools or programs. Um, it's also important for faculty to scaffold students' processes along the way when using technology. So this can involve a variety of strategies, including providing explicit instruction on the tools, offering a variety of resources that students can access along the way when they need help, um, showing various models, providing flexibility, and also um, research shows that collaborative projects also really help with students learning different digital expertise. Um, another point here, and this might be obvious, but it really helps the faculty create the digital projects that they're assigning to their students themselves. And in order to understand the needed support students will need and potential stumbling blocks. But before we jump there, I do want to ask one more question. Um, and, you know, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, so one concerning trend that we've seen in the field, especially when it comes to DEI work is that, you know, people, something will happen, you know, George Floyd murder, or, you know, there, there may be political unrest and people will, you know, get really um, concerned and respond. Um, but a lot of those DEI, you know, initiatives that are launched on campus or um, things that that pop up, they're not long lived. They're very short lived. They're very reactive. And um, we know that it's really important to make any real change in these areas um, for us to to, you know, catalyze a type of change that's going to last. Um, so what advice do you have for faculty or administrators, you know, who are in positions of power um, and looking to, you know, make changes, you know, how would you advise them to um, catalyze the type of change that's long lasting? Yeah, I can start. Um, so I think, again, um, that, well, at first I'll say that this is a, a real issue, <laughs> which is why I think folks like me who've been kind of tooting this horn for a while, I feel kind of an immense pressure of like, oh, this is trendy, like we need to get everyone on board. Um, but the idea of keeping momentum is important, keeping it centered is important, uh, which is why, again, identifying your champions, but most importantly, to build structures, right? What are the kinds of structures that can keep this in place? Um, I know I'm speaking from the perspective of a state university um, and that we have people uh, in the audience who are coming from all different kinds of institutions. And so structures and incentives will look different, especially if it's faculty who are not on the tenure track, especially if it's graduate students or um, if it's a two-year institution. And so I think talking with your faculty uh, about what are the kinds of structures that could be sustainable. So for example, at University of Michigan, uh, our graduate school just created a couple of years ago and our teaching center uh, helped with this, a professional development certificate in diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is actually a curriculum in which they can go and take workshops and um, you might not have a teaching center at your institution. And I understand that that's not the case everywhere. I recognize how privileged I am at being at the University of Michigan. Um, but that is the kind of nice thing about being online is that we have access to webinars. We have access to all kinds of other professional development. You have access to every learner everywhere. We should be giving them credit for that professional development and building structures and goals for them to work towards. Um, I think that Again, yeah, structure, structuring these, these opportunities and giving them credit for the hard work that they're doing. Whatever that looks like at your institution is gonna be key. Blaine, what do you think? How do you make it stick? Yeah, I mean, Taz makes excellent points. And so I agree that administrators can implement um, various institutional supports for faculty to help with technical needs, understanding equity-centered digital learning and also making sure students have the digital tools and access they need. Um, from a faculty perspective, I think it's just always trying to center inclusiveness when designing curriculum for students and in our own research. Yeah. We have a ton of questions coming through the chat right now. I have the Q&A, I don't know if you guys can see these. Um, so 
Um, we're going to just start at the top and go through some of your questions. And if you're if you're on the webcast and you have questions, please send them through. Um, first question is about community colleges and community college faculty. Um, are there support systems that community college faculty can access? And we and we know often these institutions have dramatically reduced support for professional development and heavy teaching loads. So flexibility in EDI course development is vital. Any thoughts? So I think um, my previous response was maybe an attempt to kind of capture some of this. Uh, there are so many great resources out there. There are also some that are not so great. <laughs> yeah. We know this, right? We are, most of us are academics. We recognize, you know, um, that not all things are created equal. But I think um, there is a ton of stuff out there that is free um, that you can access. I think the key is to offer, again, some incentive and accountability. Um, I had mentioned before the term community of practice. So that is essentially, and it's like strip, most stripped down form is identifying a group of faculty who are interested, who are mm -hmm. approximately the same level of understanding, but have a commitment to want to do better. Um, setting up, you know, a sign up sheet for people to sign up have group leaders who, you know, maybe we read a book together, maybe we watch a rabbit webinar and discuss, maybe one of us goes and talks to Taz or Blaine at, at one of these consultations and, and gets advice about what other kinds of faculty development we can do. Uh, I think there are actually more opportunities now than there were six and eight and 10 months ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is being able to kind of gather those resources. Um, and that's something that certainly offline uh, Blaine and I can help think through. Yeah, I think another place to start is to look at exemplars in the field. Um, and, you know, one that I know of is California Community Colleges. Um, you know, they have an online, um, you know, <laughs> a really, um, they, they put a lot of intentionality to building, you know, an online environment for students there. And so that may be a good place to look for resources um, and reach out and talk to people as well. Um, okay, so we'll go to another question. Um, what are some best practices from a UDL design standpoint to encourage equity and inclusion when designing from the ground up? Sure, I can try to address that. That's a great question. Um, so I think that the universal for design, um, universal design for learning framework the goal is really to expand meaning making and voices being shared. And so, as I mentioned earlier, some some strategies are being when offering content for students to consume or read, not just giving readings, but offering in different modalities, having videos, podcasts. Um, that's one of the main tenets of the framework. And then another one is multiple ways of representation. And I've, I've touched on this a bit before, but offering students flexibility in how they show their learning. So it doesn't always have to be an academic paper um, to be a meaningful way for students to convey their learning and to engage with content. You could offer a variety of different um, types of projects, perhaps a video or a podcast or, or maybe a paper is one of them, but really opening up multiple modes of expression is what um, allows for lots of different voices to be heard, in particular culturally and linguistically different voices, and for students to make those really important connections to their skills um, and to their communities. Yeah, thank you for that, Blaine. Um, we have another question. Um, <laughs> Someone pointed out that OLC is having a week-long conference on the same topic this week, and um, we should highlight that that conference is also sponsored by our network, Every Learner Everywhere. Um, and this person specifically highlighted a session by Sharice McBride, who is actually one of our ELE experts who you can schedule time with from our website, um, and that she raised the point that the digital divide includes access to technology, um, but also includes use of technology and empowerment with technology. How can institutions address all these aspects of the digital divide? So access to technology, empowerment with technology and use of technology. 
That's a, another great question. Yeah. So um, I agree with Sharice. She's a, a fabulous expert on digital literacies. And so it goes, there are these different tiers. So it goes beyond access and ways universities can help with that is to um, as in the example I gave, providing hotspots, providing tools for students who might not have access. But also we need to think about what are the digital literacies um, that all students need to have. And so this involves being able to evaluate information um, that they receive online. We are all inundated with an avalanche of information every day. And students really need the tools to discern um, and evaluate what is what is um, valid information. Um, but also we need to think of an expanded definition of literacy. Literacy today is more than reading and writing. It really involves being able to communicate multimodally and online. So how can we provide opportunities in our classes for students to be able to hone those literacy skills? Um, and then the empowerment piece is also, you know, that's, I don't know if I have the answer exactly for that one, but I feel as though when students um, do have the digital literacy skills to be able to share their voice and be a part of the conversation and also be, um, you know, a member of society and connecting to social justice issues through effective communication um, and digital literacy skills. But I'd love to hear um, what others think. Yeah, I think you said it perfectly, Blaine. I think especially from your perspective, given your research background and your experience in the classroom, I think you captured it well. So Taz, another question um, that you could start with, because I know you do some faculty training. Um, this question is about demotivated adjuncts. Um, you know, how do you deal and support them? Um, because, you know, quite frankly, you know, in some cases, they're they're bearing the brunt of you know the increased teaching loads um, with the least amount of support. Yeah, well, I mean, um, not to bring semantics into it, but we shouldn't have to deal with anyone, <laughs> right? We are definitely um, maybe starting <laughs> from How a do point we support of support them. Yeah, <laughs> support them. Yeah, thank you for reframing that, Jessica. Of I course. think that although I fully recognize that as an administrator seeing this happen in front of you on such a massive scale can feel like a problem that needs a solution, um, but recognize that demotivation is not the same across, right? Just like trauma is not experienced the same across everyone, that people have different reasons for being demotivated. And so I think the very first thing to do is to acknowledge that that's happening and that these are real valid feelings and experiences that people are having. Um, and also just kind of recognizing that demotivation is not just the, the default, um, that people go through periods every day where they're very excited to do something and then overall are not, and recognizing potentially what those things are, um, are going to be important. Now, in terms of motivation, and I think actually, Blaine, I don't remember which question it was, um, but you said something that made me think of the importance of knowing why you're doing something, right? Like, why, why is this important? Uh, I've been looking a lot into faculty burnout, uh, which is a real physiological, sociocultural phenomenon that's happening. And we have to recognize that while on the one hand we're asking faculty and yes, adjuncts, but also graduate students, also tenure track faculty. I work a lot with health sciences faculty who are both trying to you know, address the pandemic and also teach other people in the process. Um, they, they're experiencing this on a massive scale that they were not prepared for. And so um, recognizing that um, if you are asking them to be flexible, right? Like be flexible, offer alternative pathways to equitable teaching, um, extend your deadlines, <laughs> figure out new ways of grading. They're, they can only be so flexible until they start to break. And if they feel like that labor is not going recognized, um, that can obviously lead to demotivation. And I'm not saying that that's what happening, it's happening in your institution, but um, I have friends, dear friends of mine who are incredible teachers who are calling me and telling me that they don't wanna teach anymore. And that is heartbreaking to me. And so I'm lucky <laughs> that I can be there for them and remind them of why they're doing these things and also helping them recognize what are all the small ones that, that they're having um, and being able to start from those places. So I think 
awareness, acknowledgement, gratitude for the hard work that they're doing. Um, and, and not assuming that you are the only one who's supposed to come up with a solution. You need to ask them to participate in creating the solution too. Um, and that again might be happening at your institution, but I think a lot of times these folks actually know what's best for themselves. And so it might just be offering more options, things that you didn't even realize might be on the table. Yeah, that goes back to this, this idea of not solving for people without actually talking to them and getting their input. Um, yeah. This very helpful advice. Um, another question, Blaine. Maybe you could take this one because I know you know you're you're currently teaching. What are recommendations for addressing cheating prevention and consequences during emergency remote teaching online? Yeah. So I I don't feel like I am a complete expert in this area, but I for me ways that I um, I try to mitigate so that this doesn't happen is. I really focus on the process of learning and try to have multiple um, benchmarks along the way where students are showing their process and supported in the learning instead of just having a, you know, a liter literature review due at the end of the semester. There's different benchmarks where they have to do an annotated bibliography or um, do an outline. So for me, that's how I try to um, avoid that. Um, but I also think really creating authentic assessments that are student centered and students are really engaged with helps them, um, you know, also helps to avoid at the very end, you know, them wanting to, to cheat. So creating really engaging and personally relevant assessments, I think, helps with this problem. Um, we have a question from someone who teaches math specifically. Um, they ask, how could we increase EDI practices, especially when there's when it's a little more challenging to incorporate different modes of learning and assessment? For example, not all algebra concepts can be linked to real world topics. Um, I would be so happy to answer that question. Um, so I actually just wrapped up a inclusive teaching learning community for STEM faculty um, at the University of Michigan, um, which is part of a different project I'm doing, uh, which will launch actually this summer, uh, which is a MOOC on inclusive teaching for STEM faculty. And I just want to acknowledge that um, that yes, the challenges and resistances to incorporate inclusive teaching practices are very real. If you think about some of the foundations of, of STEM, right, it's the idea that it's objective. <laughs> and so why would we think about things like student identity and um, privilege and things like that? Isn't that political? Um, and perhaps it's because I'm an anthropologist, but science is political, right? Um, it is culturally situated. And even though you might be in a situation where you know, might not be able to have a cool meme or a YouTube video that you can link um, to make it feel like relevant, uh, your students have identities. Your students are experiencing um, inequities. Um, they are coming from diverse backgrounds. And so I think that for STEM educators especially, think about some of the rates around retention. Um, right, recruitment and retention in STEM education. Um, I, I will not be able to spout out that research. Uh, STEM folks know where that research is. Uh, we also have a couple of experts uh, in our network who specialize in STEM education. And so, um, but recognizing that it is our responsibility to model uh, best practices for uh, inclusion. So one quick piece of advice I have is things like normalizing failure, right? Science, science is, uh, a series of failures <laughs> that eventually worked and then we get to publish about that. Um, so talking about your own identity and experiences, normalizing failure um, and creating what I would say uh, an inclusive environment. And so I fully recognize that it's not as easy to just overnight make a lab classroom online um, and we're not asking you to do that. Um, but instead there are these other what feel potentially like um, uh, tangential things that actually could make huge improvements to uh, student learning in your classroom. Um, and some of them are actually not even related to technology. So I just want to say it's important to go back to the foundational pieces. Thank you. That was so timely and spot on. <laughs> um, we have another question from Mary about digital literacy. Um, she says this is something she brought up at with her my two year technical college seems to be put on the back burner consistently. Do you know of it? Do you know of an assessment of digital literacy skills, something we can measure at the beginning of the college career so we can provide better training? Are you familiar with any resources there? Either of you? I am not 
familiar with a digital literacy assessment, um, but that's something that, you know, I could look into and share. I think even just um, doing a survey to understand not only the access that students have, but what digital literacy practices are they doing on their own outside of school or in other classes, I think can help you get a sense um, of, of the variation in experiences and where students are. But I think that would be a fabulous um, thing to offer is to have an assessment. Yeah, and that might be a great um, topic to take up with Sharice McBride in the ALEA Expert Network who is an expert in digital literacy, she certainly might be able to provide some resources there or may be able to help you to think through, you know, what an assessment might need to look like. Definitely. Um, okay, just a, a few more, they're still coming in. Um, so question from Terry, all the experts are amazing. Do you have any, any advice on how to select which expert to meet with? Um, well, I pick can Blaine. start. Pick, pick Blaine. Pick Blaine. <laughs> I think what one place to start is by, um, you know, attending some of these sessions. Um, you know, we're, we're working very hard to um, share out information where you can get to know information about the experts and hear their perspectives and their point of view and their strengths. If you go on our website, um, you'll notice that each of the experts has kind of areas of expertise beneath their name. And so that may be another good starting point. If you know what you're looking for, you can kind of look through those, see what fits best. Um, we'll have some blogs blog posts that are coming out and more video footage and webinars and things. So if you follow us on Twitter at EveryLearnerNet, um, you'll be able to keep up with all of that. Um, any other suggestions, Taz and Blaine? I mean, I think that's definitely a good starting point. Um, I would also say that uh, ELE is hosting a number of these kinds of events, um, short interviews and partnering with people like OLC, like WCET. Um, so it perhaps is not the time right now. Maybe you are ready for winter break and you can't think about this right now, uh, but we will also have lots of offerings in January, February um, as the time goes on. So definitely keep an eye out on Twitter. Um, I know you can follow me. I think, I believe Jessica and Blaine are both on Twitter as well. So we will be highly publicizing those opportunities so you can get to kind of see what we're like in 3D um, and in action. And so that might also help. Um, so I think we're almost out of time. We have just a few minutes left. Um, and I wanted to leave a little bit of time um, for each of our experts, Blaine and Taz, to both give us one resource that they would recommend um, that educators or um, instructors or administrators turn to as they move towards inclusiveness and equity. Um, and this can include books, articles, videos, toolkits, tech tools, whatever you prefer. Um, give us give us what you leave us with. We'll start with Blaine. So I think the actually the Every Learner Everywhere um, Expert Network website has some nice resources from SD um, focused on inclusiveness and equity that are just a nice thing to look at before planning your consulting session with us and can help you kind of hone your specific questions you might have for us. Um, I did notice a couple of people asked for a reference to um, how multimedia and multimodal composing can support content learning and students connecting to their um, uh, funds of knowledge. And so uh, just a, a personal reference that I can give you. Um, I recently conducted a systematic literature review looking at 76 studies with emergent bilingual students creating digital projects. And so this review, it's in re uh, Reading Research Quarterly for 2020. It reviews all of the research and um, might be a good resource if you're wanting to look for specific references to explore more related to this area. And I can also include it here in the chat. Thanks, Blaine. What about you, Taz? Yeah, you know, um, one thing that I'm not hurting for is resources. Um, I feel like I'm subscribed to every listserv and more uh, to the point where I feel like I'm drinking out of a fire hose. I don't know if I could ask a show of hands if anyone else feels that way. So when I hear about resources, what I hear is what's something that's going to change my life, <laughs> right? What's something that's going to shift my paradigm and give me a framework that's useful. So 
One that I encountered early on uh, once we moved to remote teaching was a series of webinars that's uh, hosted on the Cora Learning um, YouTube channel. Um, specifically the series by Dr. Frank Harris III and Dr. Luke Woods, both uh, professors at uh, San Diego State University that look at um, all kinds of things related to equity and inclusion in online spaces. Um, and I think that they get to some topics that we didn't get to cover today, which I think Yel and e, we might have some events that talk about this later, but things like microaggressions in the classroom, what do identity related conflicts look like in online spaces when you're asking people to engage in social media, when you're asking them to go into Zoom breakout rooms um, and things happen, um, what's the role of a faculty, what's the role of an administrator in those situations and both of them just do such a wonderful, clear job of explaining what those situations look like and some real uh, multi-level solutions to those things. So I would highly recommend watching that webinar series. Oh, you're muted, Jessica. <laughs> of course, um, thank you. I think that's the quote of 2020, right? Um, thank you guys so much for your time today. We really appreciate, you know, all of the engagement and all of the questions. I hope we got, you know, got to as many as we could have. Um, feel free to follow all of us on Twitter. Also follow at EveryLearnerNet if you want more information about Every Learner. Um, and again, go ahead and schedule time with these incredible experts so that you can follow up one on one with them and get some really good coaching. Um, with that, Megan, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica, Blaine, and Taz. And thank you to all of the participants that were so engaged and asked wonderful questions. And there's a little bit more about the Every Learner Everywhere Expert Network. And if this is your first WCET webcast, we have a lot more in store for 2021, which is really just around the corner, thank goodness for all of us. And we have a lot of resources on our website and um, tons of upcoming um, closer look guides on key topics like high flex learning. Again, stay tuned to our, our webcast page and we will also be sending you a link with a lot of the resources that were shared today and a link to the recording. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our supporting members at WCT, Caro State University, Cooley, LLP and Michigan State University and all of our wonderful sponsors that underwrite much of our programming here at WCET. So again, thank you for your time and your participation and stay well and have a wonderful holiday. Bye all. Bye everyone, thank you for coming.